And um, good morning, happy Tuesday. And I have to take the sticky off of my, <laughs> reminding me to record it because otherwise I tend to forget. So that's my trick because I put a sticky right in front of my slides. Um, so full disclosure, I'm trying to keep these short. I promised 20 to 30 minutes. I've done social media talks that are 60 minutes. I've done social media talks that are 90 minutes. Um, I 30 minutes is tough. So what I did is I pulled this and tried to get the most pertinent slides I thought in the context of storytelling from some of my decks I've used for longer talks. So what I'm doing is I also at the end, I'll share a link to the landing page that has a recording of a longer talk, but also has the full slide deck of one of my longer talks because the longer talks just include a lot more information on policy making and more of the legalities and what happens if you post something that offends someone, you know, a lot more of those sort of things. So, um, okay, Diane, great. Yeah, get a hold of Chris. He will be happy to hear from you. Um, so we're gonna get dive right in now because it is a little bit um, of a big topic, obviously. Um, I wanna start, I think, you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in telling your story. So I'm going to start with the assumption that most of you probably already manage a social media account for your district or your organization, um, I hope. And if you don't, um, I have a couple of slides that might give you a good reason to understand why you might want to. Just some numbers. This is all easy to find online. So I'm going to go through it fairly fast. But there are a lot of people on social media, obviously a lot more in the developed countries than in the less developed countries. So it's a lot of the population that's using social right now. And make, even though Facebook has made a lot of people angry and the government's saying they're a monopoly and all the things that are happening, the truth is their stock is still going up and they're still the most widely used, especially among adults. Now, when we see some of the stats here in a minute, we'll see that it changes a little across age groups. Well, I know this is kind of like a lot to look at, but I like to include it in the slide deck so that if you do review it later or print it or something, you have access to this slide because it is kind of interesting. I and mean, this tells you some things like, you know, if you're trying to reach a 65 year old audience, don't use Snapchat, right? <laughs> or WhatsApp for, for your outreach. But you can kind of look at the demographics that are your audience and get an idea of what platforms work best for messaging. And a little bit later, I'm going to talk about um, the different types of messaging that works well for different platforms, too. That gets kind of interesting if you have the time to really have more than one account and craft your message in different ways for different platforms. So, for example, when you look at these numbers, if you were trying to reach um, 18 to 29 year olds, right? Maybe you're a Rec and Park District or you're looking for a volunteer firefighter, I don't know. But YouTube obviously is a great place to be because 91% of them are on YouTube, that's crazy. So anyway, this just kind of gives you an idea of the different demographics. And again, it's in the slide deck that you can download as a PDF. And I'm gonna throw my gum away because I remember my mom telling me not to swallow it. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, this is just another way of looking at the stats in case you like lines and colors instead of numbers. Um, but again, just looking at the different usage across all adults. Again, this doesn't break it down by age group. So these are just some of the reasons why. Um, the other thing I like about social is that it can be so personal. You know, um, and I, I know I've been saying that ever since the beginning of this, this series, but people want personal connection now and social is great for that, as you know. It's also great for angry disagreements over politics, but let's just pretend that's not happening right now and think really about how we can connect with our communities using social media. And so and the first thing I like to always remind people is if you don't already have a social media account for your district, find out where people are because the numbers can tell you a lot that we just looked at but you have uh, methods of reaching out to your actual district people to ask them what they use and how they prefer to receive information from you. You might be interested to know that, I don't know, but you may find out that someone that a certain age group only wants to get, you know, bill related, service related messages via email, period. They don't want to go to Twitter to have to look for that or anything like that. And yeah, a um, couple people, Jackie and Michael, both talking about Nextdoor 
Yeah, next door is an interesting one. Um, if you are an organization on next door, unless they've changed their rules, you can post, but you can't actually interact with people. So it's a little different animal, but yes, it's definitely more locally focused for sure. For sure. So next door is great. Um, and then of course, how they want to get information from you again might change based on the type of information they're getting. They might like to run across your programs on Facebook if you are a Rec and Park district or something like that, but then they're going to come to your website for something else or they want to get an email for some other sort. And that doesn't mean that you have to like provide all of these different things. I really tell most of my districts not to try and sign up for every social media platform out there if you haven't been managing them for a while because it's a lot. It's a lot. So it's better to kind of know where the majority of your people are and then to focus on one or two, get good at it, really give it some effort to make sure you get some followers because we all know without followers, nobody's going to see your content anyway, right? So this is just one of the tools that we've used over the years. It's called Survey Gizmo. Um, you've all heard, I'm sure, of Survey Monkey. Sorry, needed some water. Same thing, you can create surveys, you can send them out to people, you can make really pretty graphs with all the results. Um, also, if, you, if you're one of our Streamline clients or if you use like WordPress or pretty much any modern website platform, you probably have forms you can add to your site. Maybe you can get some feedback there. Um, you know, depending on the form software, you may not have pretty graphs and everything else, but you'll at least have numbers and you will have learned something. Okay, so this part to me is, I have to admit, I fall down on this often, really taking the time to back up and know what your intention is. And I don't even mean just for being on social, that's important, especially if you haven't done it so far much and you want to take the effort to do it. Um, but, but like, is your intention, like every time you post officially as an organization, I'm not talking about necessarily you know, your volunteer firefighter sharing something on a scene or something like that, which is a whole nother can of worms that we aren't going to have time for today. But there is some information in that and in some of the talks I've given. And I'm always, um, as usual, super happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about this stuff because I love it. Um, I don't actually love social media so much, but I do find it fascinating and I love um, learning about it and, and the idea of it being used by districts to really connect with their communities. So know your intention. Like You don't want to be posting just because you have a social account and oops, I haven't posted in a week. And yes, I have been guilty of that in the past. It's like, oh, right, I have to remind people I'm here. Really important. What is it you want them to do? Do you want them to do something with the information that you share with them? Do you want them to feel a certain way? We talked about that in a couple of the other talks. Do you want them to um, share with people so that more people follow you, more people learn about you? Do you want them to come to an event? Really kind of understanding the intention of what it is you're trying to do. This is kind of how I feel about social right here. Uh, just kidding. I'm not that bad at it. It just doesn't come as like first nature to me. I'm more like newspaper background. So what makes content shareable? So of course an audience to share it. So here's your first challenge, right? When you first start building up a following, it's a little difficult because you don't have that many people following you. So not too many people are seeing it. So that's one of the reasons why I'm always banging that drum of include people because people are going to want to share it with their people, right? So if you include people from the community or, you know, local efforts, or maybe you're not even talking about yourself, but you're highlighting something else amazing that somebody's doing in, in your district, anything like that that's going to get them to want to go share it and follow you back, that kind of stuff is great. Now, of course, interesting local people, like I said, humor, everybody loves a little bit of humor. Um, it's not always easy to write good content. I will be the first one to admit that. Um, but back in the day, like when this picture was taken, my, my best friend, Heather, if you were on our last talk, you already hear me say this, she's quite a bit shorter than I am. She's like right here short to compared to me. And so when the kids were dressing up in our gear, for some reason, every time they paired up like this, she, her kid was always taller. She was so proud. You know, like that's the kind of thing that's fun to share on social media and the kids' faces aren't showing. So I don't have to get, well, there's one kid in the background that I would want to blur out, but I don't have to get like permission to share this on social or anything else. I'd probably wipe out the license plate number of our fire engine. 
Um, but, but like, this is the kind of thing, you know, if you share this kind of stuff and tag people that came to the station or anything like that, they're more likely to share it too. So speaking of intention, if you want to study some brilliant Twitter accounts, if you're on Twitter, go follow New Jersey and go follow Wendy's. If you don't want to follow a ton, there are a bunch more that are amazing. New Jersey is the snarkiest account. They're just hilarious. Um, they, and they always get in these, and a lot of it I don't understand because I'm not from there, but they get in these wars with Delaware and these Twitter wars with New York. And they are hilarious. The, the two women running the Twitter account at New Jersey are amazing. So this is the first tweet that really took off for them. This was back in December of last year. So somebody says, who let New Jersey have a Twitter? And they're like, your mom. I don't know if you're close to my age. You remember that being like the snarky comeback to pretty much everything. The next day they tripled their followers. Yeah, they tripled their followers. Tyler, yes, Wendy's account is like that too, the fast food place. Exactly, exactly. So if you're going to be doing this, it makes sense. You can even just Google the best social media accounts and go follow some of them and see their methods of really engaging citizens. Wendy's has got one where like Wendy's is like dissing people and they're asking for it. They're like, how come Wendy's hasn't done that to me yet? And so it's just funny, funny stuff. Um, there's some actually better ones from this too, but they're like threads that are hard to show on a slide. Um, so there's a lot of places to get inspiration on things like this. And so, um, I, like I said, I just went and Googled the best social media posts of all time. And you can even look up the best government social media presences of all time. And that's how I ended up finding the New Jersey people, which I actually already followed them because they were, they're just funny. So there's just lots of clever stuff out there. I don't know if like me, you have seen um, totally like kind of unrelated, but it's sort of somewhat related. You're driving down the road and you pass a church and they've got, you know, the sign outside and some of them say, you know, God loves you church Sunday at 10 or whatever. But then they have some that are just hilarious sayings, right? And like, I always look and it's always catches my eye and makes me actually just have, have some warmth for that church because the humor is so great. So great idea to do this. I don't know the other thing. Have you all heard of there's the dad with the bad dad jokes that he's writing on a big whiteboard and putting outside in their yard. Probably there's more than one now, but anyway, guy was kind of, kind of getting famous during the pandemic for cheering people up. Now, not always just humor, right? One of the other things is that, you know, share accomplishments of people in your community and they're gonna wanna share your post with other people, right? And you're honoring other people, which is fantastic. And this is great. This is one of our customers, but it's like if, if you have permission from the kids in your programs to post stuff, heck yeah, post it because their parents are going to want to reshare it. The family members, especially right now, of course, not that everybody's playing baseball right now or whatever, but right now the family members who are like far away would love to see these videos and you get like more and more people sharing, right? More and more people paying attention. This just seemed to me just too, too apropos for our time right now. And sometimes I feel like this is what my tortoise is doing for my company. I have, a, um, I think you all know, I have a little Russian baby tortoise. This is a really bad drawing of him, but he's like this big, he's tiny. And um, I turned my desk into an enclosure and I put him on my desk and then I just put my phone camera on him and he joins some of our Zoom meetings. <laughs> That's kind of, kind of what's happening there too. He needs his own social presence. Okay, hashtags. So if you don't know how hashtags work, um, they, they're used to categorize content. It's kind of a free for all. Unfortunately, it's a little bit like the Wild West. So you might have the same hashtag, but with five misspellings, you might. Um, but if you want to use hashtags um, for content that you think other people have posted and you want your content sh to show up as well, when people search for those hashtags, then you might want to do a little research first, you know, do some searches on hashtags first. Um, it does increase engagement, but interestingly, all the stats say until you use more than two hashtags, you know, so if you post something that's like five words long and then like five hashtags after it, that's not nearly as good as if you just post good content with some good keywords and then pick a couple of hashtags up to two. Here are the rules when using hashtags, you can't use spaces. 
you can't use punctuation. You can tell this drives my journalist background brain crazy. You can't use special characters and capitalization is just for readability. So if I had that on all lowercase, it would be the exact same hashtag as the, the camel case. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I know I get a lot of questions about hashtags from people. Hashtags obviously are used much more heavily in Twitter than other places, but they do actually work across most platforms. And again, I have been pushing this hashtag. When you guys tell your story and you have amazing stories to tell, use this hashtag if you're not already using two others. <laughs> use this hashtag so we can start to kind of amplify each other's voices in each other's stories. I've been interviewing some of our customers just to learn not, not about them being a customer, but to learn about what they're actually up to in their communities. And it's super inspiring. So I'm trying to find the time to write some of those up and start sharing them. And I will use this hashtag. So hopefully you'll be watching for it once in a while. And when you use a hashtag, a hashtag with TBT, it typically stands for Throwback Thursday. I just found that out yesterday or the day before. All right, so our online attention span is super short. I give like an entire talk on writing for the web and there's a whole section on the research behind this. Um, and we actually have, you know, in reputation, we have beat goldfish because goldfish supposedly have a nine second attention span. And in everything I was reading, I guess people who actually work with goldfish are pretty offended because they have pretty good attention spans. It's not nine seconds. So. Apparently we have really beat them. So you've got about eight seconds to really catch somebody's attention and give them a second to just glance through what you've got and see if they're interested in reading it. Now, this is the part I find interesting is, you know, posting different types of content to different types of platforms. This is difficult. It's difficult for me. We're a small team. I'm the only one that does any social media. Plus I do all of these webinars and all the free education and I, uh, lead the product team and um, I do all the marketing and I do all the content writing and so I am not nearly as good at social I just don't have the time I wish I had but I, I'm so inspired by organizations that understand how to really leverage these so Facebook is very much about people right it's about people who's doing what what's like what's going on this is and somebody just gave me this little kind of a, a meme on this. Twitter is definitely now. It's like, here's what's happening in the moment. Very newsy, very fast flowing as anyone knows who's been on Twitter. Instagram is more like a what's happening. So lots of like outdoor shots, travel stuff, crafty things, things like that. And of course, YouTube is very good for how. YouTube is good for lots of things, but it is kind of amazing how many times I talk to somebody and say, oh yeah, I Googled whatever and I found this great article. And they're like, why don't you just go to YouTube? You can watch somebody do it. And I'm just not video oriented, you know? I, I don't know, I'm word oriented. So I just don't do that, but so many people do. So kind of interesting little guidelines. It doesn't mean that's you can only post who content to Facebook, right? And then of course there's more than this. There's LinkedIn too, right? Which is a much more business oriented, very factual kind of um, newsy type sharing platform as well. So TSA, I can't say TSA is my favorite organization. Um, they stopped me once for an hour and a half because not all four of my names were on my ticket. There were only three of my four names on my ticket and they didn't like that. So hour and a half and I was totally freaked out. It was awful. However, I love their approach to social media. So they are great at this different content in different platforms. So instead of taking the same message and just posting it here and here and here, They've got different people engage with them for different reasons on different platforms. So the, their Twitter feed is very educational and newsy. So there'll be, you know, there'll be timely stuff on here. Like, did you know that the, the security checkpoint at X airport is, is reopened and we're getting people through faster than ever or whatever. There's lots of stuff like that happening on Twitter. And then on Facebook, it's much more warm and fuzzy and educational. They, they, I mean, and this isn't, these aren't hard, fast rules, even with their presence, but they're one of the best I've seen that like Facebook is the warm stories, the touchy feely stories, the things about families and them trying to really get some brand awareness and um, improve their reputation, I would say. Um, I got, yeah, I got a chat. Sorry, just real quick on read. If I'm elected to the board, I'm wanting to a monthly, did you know an area history factoid? Yeah, yeah, did you know? We're in Auburn, so we have a rich gold rush, railroad, iron ore history and founding families. 
I'm calling you Hill too. We're Gold Rush Town. That's just cool. I love it. It would be great for newbies to the area and drive by people to the website on regular intervals. Yep, we we're thinking about having old timers do short interviews that have been in the district for 50 plus years. So we can combine the tw Twitter hashtags, drive it. I think that's brilliant, Diane. And I will tell you one of the things you might want to look at too is Story StoryCorps. That's S T O R Y C O R P S, StoryCorps. If you haven't heard of that before, all of you, if you're capturing stories, especially of like old timers and people who've been around and have great stories to tell in your community, StoryCorps is so great because you don't have to, but you can choose to allow your stories to be recorded to the Library of Congress. So as you're getting these oral histories from people, they become part of this national fabric of oral histories of the building of our communities. It's very, very cool. I love that. I love that. And I hope your project, I hope you win your board seat and your project works. Um, I love TSA on Instagram. They are hilarious. Underwear, check. Soap on a rope, check. Bunny slippers, check. Box of inner replica rocket propelled grenade launchers, <laughs> right? So they just, there's a lot more humor on, on Instagram, but you don't see these same posts across all of the different social channels. So I just think that that's a brilliant approach. Obviously they have a lot more money than I do and a lot more time and a lot more staff probably than you all do as well. But it's some inspiration and it tries to help me remember to come back to what is my intention it doesn't take that much longer to craft a message a little differently, maybe a little more visually for an Instagram account than something like a Twitter. So anyway, so now this stuff is not as much of the fun storytelling, but I felt like I had to try and get some of it in here. I did this talk with an attorney. So that deck has a lot of information on the Public Records Act and the Brown Act and, and the way you have to behave when it comes to social. I have very little time left, so I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. But again, the other slide deck that I will share with you has a lot more information on all of this. So you all know the PRA, if you're in California, if you're in a different state and you're with me today, hello and thanks for the travel. Um, your FOIA Act, you know, whatever it is that is your records act in your state. In California though, that's the state I know best, it is all communications regarding to public business. They don't care where it is. They don't care what device you've used it on. Like it's just, it doesn't matter. Electronic records are specifically included in this. Yes, it does include social media. Anything that relates to the conduct of government regardless of the platform. So imagine, you know, you're promoting, well, that home run video, right? somebody could make a Public Records Act request for not only the video, but all the comments that were attached to it because it's related to public business. This last bullet I put in here because deleted content is really, really dangerous. Again, in the longer talks, I go into, you know, why you can't block people because as a government entity, you're blocking their First Amendment right to communicate if you block them on social. And that went all the way back to Trump when he was blocking people and then they said he couldn't. And it, it, there's a lot, a lot behind this. There's some mayors that tried to do it and you just can't. And, and in terms of deleting comments, I will say, and I'm not your attorney, so you, know, you might wanna talk to somebody who gets paid to give advice, but I love giving free advice. I would say if somebody posts a comment that is against your policies so clearly that you would like have them removed from a public meeting. So for example, if they're threatening someone, um, spouting racist hate speech, I don't know. If they're doing something that you have policies against on social media, then I would say, yes, you can delete. Don't hide it because you're only hiding it from yourself. Important to know. Yes, you can delete comments, but I'm telling you take a screen capture first. The screen capture should have the date on the file, they all do. Save it somewhere and document it so that if something comes back later and they say they deleted my comment just because I disagreed with them and they're infringing on my First Amendment rights, which th this has happened, there have been cases like this. So, sorry, I'm gonna talk kind of fast now because I keep trying to keep these to 30 minutes. Um, private devices, this is just a case. Yes, email and text count. If it's related to public business, they don't care what device you use, they don't care you know, what account you used. If you're talking about public business, they may be able to search your private devices and your private social accounts and all kinds of stuff if you're talking about public business. 
Now, this gets a little bit intense. These are a lot of words. I don't expect you to digest all of this right here, but I've got two slides here about an update that was just signed into law last month. So really kind of defines how you're able to um, discuss official business on social. So making posts, commenting, and even using emojis, right? So somebody, somebody puts a post about, I don't know, something that you're gonna be talking about in a public meeting, and then some public member comments, and then a board member tries to answer that comment, and then you get like three thumbs up from the other board members. Like it gets really complicated. Okay, I'm not gonna leave this up too long. Here's slide two. Um, Serial meetings, again, same sort of thing, responding directly to any communication by another board member. It gets a little complicated. Again, you don't need to read all of this right now. I'm gonna tell you how to get to a really great article on this that explains it, but this is brand new and it's something that's really important for you all to know about. So if you Google BBK, which is a law firm, they're fantastic and they've got tons of great educational information. And the law is AB992. So if you Google that, then you should be able to go find all the information you need to make sure that you're being in compliance with, with all of these changes. Uh, chat, Michael, hi Michael, we use hub and spoke model, web post or cross posted to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. But I'm hearing you say tailor messages for each platform. If you don't have budget and time for that, is hub and spoke model still okay? Yeah, of course. And here's the thing, we're all doing the best that we can. And I am so guilty of, cause I use HubSpot and in HubSpot I can go, post something to the site and then I go, oh, I want to share it to social. Do I want to share it to Twitter? Do I want to share it to Facebook? Do I want to... And, and I do that sometimes, right? Because it's just the best that I can do. So yeah. And if you have something really important you want to share, it might make sense once in a while to tailor the messages, but sometimes you just don't have the time. So that's fine. That's a great question. Okay. Policies. So again, coming back to like the legalities of this new law that was signed into to place and the fact that we've got Brown Act and Public Records Act and FOIA Act implications related to social, it's important for you to have policies. And I go into this a lot more in my longer talks, but as briefly, because we're almost out of time, a general policy describing the purpose, like again, what is your intention and how do you plan to moderate comments? And even like what hours do you intend to like reply? Just really having an understanding of that internally, right? Posting and interacting, who gets to post on behalf of the district? This is very important for volunteer fire districts, possibly rec and park too, but I just have experience with fire where you've got a bunch of firefighters, we're all excited down on a scene taking pictures of fire. Typically we're not because we're so busy fighting a fire, but you know, they're like things slow down and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna share this on social. Well, do you, is that allowed? Are they clear that it's allowed? All of that sort of stuff, you need a policy for this. Internal again, the expectations for the use of social media while you're on district time, right? So if I manage the, the Facebook page for my company, which I do, do I get to go on Facebook and add my post, but then also like start poking around and then go down the rabbit hole because we know how well that goes. Sometimes it can be a while, right? So they have since gotten their, their identity back, but um, someone who ran for the board because they were really angry with the Harper district created a Facebook account using their logo and their name. And the only way you knew it wasn't actually them um, behind the posts was the word unofficial. And so um, since then they've been able to get control of it, but you should have a policy that states who can post as the district, right? Um, there is a policy for posting offensive, offensive personal opinions while clearly an affiliated employee or on district time. So here's one where a fire district puts something about, um, you know, how much they help the community, they love the community, but they had one of their firefighters who was very, very, very vocal and very racist. And so you end up with something like this, right? So it gets to be a slippery slope. You know, do you control what your employees post on Facebook? Like, I'm not suggesting that. And you definitely would be best served to have an attorney help you with your policies. But again, you can't just delete offensive posts if they're super offensive and you're really clear, like I said, go ahead, document it real quick and then delete it. But it's gotta be really over the top. It can't just be something that disagrees with you because then you really have violated the first amendment rights. And then they just removed the pages altogether and that got them in even more trouble. So that's not something you wanna be doing either. 
And then of course, this is the one we talked about, spending the whole day at the office, catching up with your old college buddies on Facebook. And then your boss likes one of your pictures back, you know, that you just posted from college, right? So knowing that your employees know what it is they're allowed to do, really important. Um, and this is just, if you would, this is gonna be in the slides as a link too, but if you write this down, engage.getstreamline.com slash social, there's a page with, like I said, the longer slide deck, a recording, there are example policies there, a Word document you can download and actually edit so that you can start with your own policy. You know, I kind of grab some resources from all over the place. So that is a good spot to go. I will add that link to our storytelling page, land, landing page too. So you don't have to go to two different places if you don't want to. But this is just a really important resource because there is a lot more information regarding all of this. Ah, we did it, 33 minutes. All right. Okay, and um, from Diane, could put uh, could put that a story app or website on here so I can bookmark it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, StoryCorps. I will add that to the land page, landing page too because you will love it. It's just so inspiring. Diane, D Dina, you're welcome. Um, next week we're going to be talking about website and email campaigns. Um, again, a lot to cover in one week, but we will do the best that we can. And then, of course, I'll share lots more resources. And I am happy to hang out if anybody has any questions. And again, use, use your hashtags, use your hashtags if you can. And the other thing too, is if you have a story to tell and you want, you're gonna go through the effort to like go put it on social, please reach out and let me know so that I can try to help amplify it and share it and all of that. Um, oh, Jackie, great question, the slide deck. Okay, look, here is, let me show you where to get the slide deck. Um, Get streamline.com. I think it's story. I think. Oops, no. Mm, storytelling. Mm. Oh, I know what it is. Sorry. Engage.getstreamline.com. Story. Sorry. It's that same. It's like the, our little land, uh, subdomain. Engage.getstreamline.com slash story. And that's where every week the recording is here and the slide deck is here. I will put a link on this page to StoryCorps as well as I promised Diane. And then I'll also put a link over to the longer social media talk too, so that you can see all those if you want to. And um, hopefully that's helpful. Thank you so much everybody for spending time with me again. I wish I had done this as a meeting so I could see your faces. Hopefully some of you are coming to the disaster planning workshop in November. Um, Kathleen, you're welcome. It's always so good to see your name in here. Um, so at our webinars page, sorry, I'm just gonna open this one real quick. At our slash webinars page, you'll see down here, we're doing a disaster planning workshop. So that'll be a meeting. So if you come, at least I'll be able to see you and we can talk, um, but that's gonna be fun. It's, you know, it's a little bit of work, but it's an hour and we'll be able to be together. So it'll be fun. Oh, you're very welcome, Roxana, Jennifer, thank you. And have a great week, everybody. Welcome, Michael. Take care, everyone. See you next week.